what is the point of negotiating a seller credit? You know, besides the obvious thing, you know, it's free seller money. You know, sometimes you think about that. And that's certainly one context where, you know, you're in a negotiation, you think you can get a little bit from the seller, and that's just the way that you go about the negotiations that you think you can maximize the outcome. You get some money from the seller towards your closing costs and prepays. But a lot of times you go in there with a strategy of negotiating a seller credit not to lower the price point that the seller is willing to, to part with the property at, but basically just to structure the deal a different way. Get the seller the same price that he let it go for anyway, but structure it with a seller credit so that it benefits you, the borrower. And that's really what this video is really kind of about. What's, what's the point? And generally, the, the reason you go in and negotiate a seller credit is because you want to leverage a smaller amount of cash. Because and, and I'll illustrate how this happens. You know, here we have a column, same transaction. You know, here is with a seller credit, and here's without a seller credit. And what I want to illustrate is kind of how this works. Okay, here's the punchline, same deal. This is a ninety thousand dollar property. Now, now you're probably wondering why that purchase price is a hundred, but this is a property that the seller is willing to part with for 90. They've listed it for 100. Let's say we're positing here in this scenario, listed it for 100, um, but they're willing to part with it for 90. And you know that you're going to go in and you're going to get it for 90. But the way you can either go in straight up and, and offer 90 and get it for 90, or you can offer 100 and ask for a $10,000 seller credit. So why, why would you do one versus the other? And so, and, and, you know, kind of the punchline here is this cash to close number. Right. If you go in and you pay 90, but in the form of a hundred thousand dollar purchase with a with a ten thousand dollar seller credit, your cash all in is going to be about 20k. Yeah, here. But if you go in and say, oh, I'm just going to go straight 90, lower sales price, but somehow you have a higher cash to close of 28k. Now, why is that? Why is that? And basically, it's this is the way that seller credits work. Is you have this purchase price. And the bank, let's say you're going to put 20% down. You don't want to pay mortgage insurance. If you put less than 20% down, you would trigger mortgage insurance. And so you're going to put 20% down. So your loan to value is 80%, the inverse of your down payment amount. So that's $80,000 they're going to lend you. So your down payment's 20, but then you have closing costs and prepays of 10K, right? So that's where you say, okay, I'm going to ask the seller to contribute 10000 toward my closing costs. Because remember, this house is worth ninety. The seller is willing to part with it for ninety. he He's got it listed for hundred, And so the seller is going to pay that. So you end up basically only bringing your down payment to close. That's the whole twenty k. Now, the numbers don't always work out that neatly, but the principle is the same, right? The principle is the same. You're only bringing in your down payment plus closing costs less the credit that the selling is willing to pay toward your closing costs. So for this situation, when you go in with a seller credit, let's say that 20,000 20, is about all you have and you don't really want to borrow more over over 20%, over 80% of the purchase price because that's going to trigger mortgage insurance, make your loan more expensive. You don't want to do that. Well, one way to do that is to say, okay, I'll offer you the list price, even though I know I can get it for less and ask you to contribute $10,000 toward my, toward my closing costs. And so, and the reason this works is because the lender respects this purchase price right here. Even though they know, you know, they're not stupid. They, they see the same thing we do. They know that ultimately if a seller tells you, I'm going to sell it to you for, for 90,000 or I'm going to sell it to you for a hundred, but I'm going to pay $10,000 of your cost in both cases. That house just sold for 90000 They know that. But the Fannie and Freddie guidelines allow seller contribution toward closing costs. In this scenario, you know, they allow these things to happen. Now, it's subject to appraiser discretion. The appraiser has to go out there and value the property. And by and large, they allow these things as well, too. They recognize that that's just part of normal, normal market practices. And within reason, with, and generally reason being defined as the guidelines set by Fannie and Freddie, as long as the seller contributions don't exceed those, appraisers are generally not factoring in those um, seller contributions into their valuation. They're looking at it saying this this property sold. It was it was offered on the open market and it sold for a hundred thousand because that's the contract price they agreed to. And by and large, you're generally going to get that. You know, your your appraiser is going to come in at contract value because that's typically the definition of market value is what these buyers and sellers agreed to. But if instead you went straight in and said no, I'm just going to offer ninety. 
you know, and I'm and I'm not, you know, I'm just going to pay 90. I'm not going to ask for any seller credit. I'm still giving the seller 90, both cases. But in this case, I'm going straight 90. Well, now the lender says, look, I'm only lending you 80% of 90, right? That Yeah, that's still, you know, you, you could borrow, you could still borrow that loan amount of 80K if you wanted to, but now your loan to value would be 80,000 divided by 90, not divided by 100. And uh, that would be over 80% in trigger mortgage insurance. And so in this case, you know, if you want to keep your 20%, stay out of mortgage insurance, the lender is only going to lend you 80% of the purchase price. And the purchase price is 100 or 90. It's not 100 less than 10 the seller's paying. The contract price or purchase price is 100 here, 90 here, even though the net to the seller is the same. And so the lender is only lending you 72K. Now, of course, now your down payment's less, right? Because you're putting 20% down on a lower purchase price. So that's only 20% of 90K, it's 18K. But here's where the kicker is. You've got to pay your own $10,000. You still got that $10,000 of closing costs and prepaid expenses. And so now your all in cash to close is 28K. So that's why you would do, that's the point of negotiating a seller contribution is to get that cash to close number down typically. And notice that's not free money, right? Your equity at closing in both of these deals, you bought a house for 90,000, right? So the value of what you own at the end of either of these deals isn't impacted by whether you structured it this way or that way, it's still worth 90,000. And so your equity here is, is going to be 90,000 less the $80,000 loan or 10K. Here it's going to be 90,000 less the $72,000 loan or 18K. So you, you know, you're effectively borrowing a higher percentage of the purchase price without triggering mortgage insurance by using that seller contribution strategy. So that's why you would do it. Now, one thing I want to point out now, you know, like I said, this is primarily about when you're wanting to negotiate that seller credit going in. But what if you're just in the midst of an inspection and you, and you realize that there are some things that need to be done and, and, and the seller is willing to negotiate and you can you know, get some more money from the seller and you just happen to negotiate that. So you go in with a contract price of 100,000 or 90,000, let's say, and then you happen to, to negotiate some seller contributions in the process. And the question often comes up is, well, what, what should I, you know, why, why not just lower the purchase price? Why not just lower the purchase price? And this will become more of a question now when buyers and sellers are going to be more sensitive to realtor commissions, right? Because realtor commissions are typically a percentage of the contract price. And buyers and sellers are going to be more sensitive to that, especially now that buyers are going to have to think about that every single time and more explicitly and have those conversations. So why not just factor that in? Why not just lower the purchase price instead if you don't need the cash, right? Let's just say this is something that came up in the transaction where you have an opportunity to have the seller pay for some future repairs or just lower, you know, contribute towards your closing costs because of things that you discovered and you get that negotiation and, and why not just negotiate a reduction in the purchase price? And the main reason I would say is that it just complicates your underwriting process unnecessarily and potentially slows that down, potentially leads to a delay in closing. And that's where your primarily, you know, primary problem you might run into because you, if you negotiate a change in the purchase price, in the contract price, and you've already been through the kind of the preliminary pre-approval process, then that has to go back through underwriting. You have to get a new contract, right? You, you, instead of just an addendum, you know, you, I mean, you may just do it through an addendum, changing the purchase price. But now essentially you have to go back to underwriting with that and say, okay, the, the value is lower. And that has to go back to the appraiser because the appraiser on his appraisal is saying, here's what the contract price was for this property. And let's say you've already got that and it says it was 100, but now you've negotiated it down. You say, okay, I negotiated 10K from the seller, but instead of taking a seller credit, I took a um, $10,000 reduction in price. Well, now the appraiser has to go back and redo his appraisal. And so it has to go back through underwriting. The appraiser has to go back and redo their appraisal and all kinds of other uh, you know, things might be Im implicated or impacted by that a title all, all of those things have to be adjusted when you change the purchase price versus simply negotiate a seller contribution so that might be more valuable just the the convenience and ease and confidence that you're still going to be on track for closing on time versus you know the the relatively small amount of money that might change if you change the purchase price instead and lower agent commissions involved in that. So anyway, that's it for today. 
Thanks so much.